In 46 years, I've never tolerated a soul. My earliest shameful memory came into being around the same time as my youngest sister. I was six years old, living at the frayed edges of Glasgow, two slightly smaller sisters between me and the baby, who was swaddled on this day in her fourth-hand baptismal robe. Like everyone else in the neighbourhood, we observed the Catholic convention of the christening peace. A sandwich, or peace as it's more commonly known in that part of the world, with a silver coin pressed into its nondescript filling, is wrapped in paper and thrown to the first youngster you meet on the way to the chapel. Tradition dictates it should go to a child of the opposite sex. The council block we lived in was nicknamed the Vatican Square and not on account of any Michelangelo's, but for the overwhelming number of Catholics who lived there. And sixpences were hard to come by, so it wasn't unusual for gangs of kids to form a scrum outside any newborn's door to jostle for the spoils. I think the boy who caught our peace was called Robin Muirhouse, though I remember our exchange better than his name. In a blaze of spite and misplaced authority, I told him he couldn't keep his catch because he was a Protestant. Without breaking her stride, good arm holding the baby, my mother used her spear to administer a stinging scalp to my bare leg to serve as a placeholder until she had time to give me the dressing down I deserved after Mass. Because for all the sectarian violence and religious tension that surrounded us, I never saw her or my father rise to the kind of bigotry it wrote, nor stand by when others did. My humiliation at my mother's hand, and later by my father's tongue, taught me that tolerance was not mine or anyone's to bestow. Shame is a hell of a teacher. By the time I left Scotland... At 19, with a friend, a bad perm and a few hundred in my pocket, I was ready for the second act of my life, which I'll abridge for this story. But in the space of a year, I had met the husband with whom I would share two children, four homes and 26 summers, most of them happy. Our eventual breakup in 2007 was both inescapable and desolating for all of us. But like almost all of us, we fumbled our way out of the wretchedness. In the last scene, I got divorced wrote a book, and reconfigured my life. It was a time for curating, for cutting away everything and everyone that didn't belong to me anymore. I met Kerry some six years later when she invited me to give a speech. She was heading up diversity for an investment bank and they were interested in my hypothesis, which is that we're all diverse, that each of us comes complete, not just with a mind and a mouth, but with a voice that's as much a fingerprint as our handwriting will eventually become. That we all have one true note we were destined to sing. Charlie Parker blew his out the horn. Alice Walker's is laid bare every time she opens her mouth. But even the less virtuoso among us have a virtue that's unmistakably ours. And I spend much of my time helping people find more and more ways of combining who they are with what they do. I had dinner with the heads of the group that night. I only really had ears for Kerry. She's brilliant and witty and curious and we became friends as fast as our dinner companions faded to black. Firm friends present themselves rarely when you're in your 50s but I remember going home and telling my daughter that I thought I'd met a soulmate. Over the coming months we traded books and music and opinions and personalities all via email since I'd come back to London and she was in New York. She discovered my love for tennis and invited me to the US Open. Later in the year, there was another dinner and an evening at the Blue Note, but it was the night at the movies that changed everything. As I walked towards the Ziegfeld Theatre, I caught sight of a nervous, ardent suitor, cartoon heart on her face, and realised she was waiting for me. Later, as she glowed in the dark of the cinema, I had an unfamiliar desire to know what it might, maybe, kind of, sort of, feel like to hold her hand. That was the night I entertained it, but with hindsight, I knew she had a crush on me. Her eyes told me the first time we met, and have done every time she's looked at me since, but we both knew I was straight. What I didn't know was how little that mattered. 
Over the course of the next few months, we exchanged almost 3,000 letters in digital copper plate that might as well have been scented paper, many of them as long as this piece. It could have taken us years to learn what we found out about each other in those weeks. Like the fact that Kerry had never been in love, never had any relationship of real significance and had years ago renounced any desire for one. She's a successful self-made woman, an introvert whose life outside work was one of elective solitude, inclined to be alone rather than with someone who was less than perfect for her. Actually, I tell a lie. There was a relationship. Loretta was an old English sheepdog, Kerry's best pal since she was a puppy. They did everything together for 13 years, and Loretta passed away only a couple of months before we fell in love. Well, before I fell in love, that is. You see, Kerry says she found her note the minute we met and pursued me with the force it takes to start an insurrection without my knowledge or consent. We agreed to find some time together to explore how we felt and what we were going to do. So we met in Miami and spent a week in solitary union, never apart save for the early mornings, when Kerry made it her business to indulge my passion for coffee. After much research, she found the purveyor of the finest beans, and made a ritual out of bringing me the perfect brew before it lost optimum temperature. So every morning she'd step out onto Ocean Drive, and I'd lean out of the window to wave and watch the ocean as I waited for her still unfamiliar gate to come back into view. One very particular morning, as I watched her back get smaller, I noticed a couple coming towards her, holding hands and the leash of a spectacular Great Dane, They were causing quite the commotion, some people stopping just to marvel, the bolder ones to pet him. But Kerry? Kerry walked past the dog without even a sideways glance, and it dawned on me. Kerry doesn't love dogs. She only loved Loretta. And she couldn't have loved anyone else. She only loves me. It was just one of a dozen moments that presented themselves as epiphanies, happenings that explained her and helped me make up my mind. This was the beginning of my third act. And in becoming Kerry's partner, I became, in most people's eyes, a lesbian. How old were you when you first realised you were straight? That's one of my pet questions. I ask it occasionally when met with its more common counterpart. I never identified as straight for 50 years of my life, though if you were looking at the facts of it, I was. Yet I never felt any kinship with the straight community. So many of my gay friends are unsurprised that I won't wear the lesbian label with any more or less affiliation than I did its predecessor. Ellen Page's beautiful coming out speech was moving to me and millions like me, not because she said she was gay though that surely brought solace to scared kids around the world who are trying to be themselves and suffering at the hands of ignorance or worse. By speaking up, she gave them comfort that even if the past and the present are hard to bear, intolerable even, the future may not be. No, it was her invocation to love rather than judge, to connect rather than control, that I found so heartening. The people who will reject her, and Michael Sam, and thousands of others, less high-profile people like Kerry and I, those people have dust in their eyes. They're used to doing what they're told. Their minds respond better to right and wrong and black and white because ambiguity is an uncomfortable state for them. But it's surely the most important, in fact, the only orientation we need for living in peace. Life's too diaphanous for stereotypes, not because they're wrong, but because they're not all there is. In my experience, the suit very rarely fits, and whether you acquire them by chance or by choice, labels can be unfaithful and mercurial companions. I'm more than the irreducible sum of my parts. We all are. And yet now that I'm in a same-sex relationship, the very act of holding hands speaks for me in a way it never did before. Now most people have an opinion before they have a reaction. The skin we are in outranks who we are in the eyes of so many, still. 
So we're experiencing prejudice for the first time. Nothing dramatic, though it's early. Just the occasional catcall and the odd tepid glare when we lock hands anywhere that's not London or New York. Any negativity I've come across so far has inspired an unfamiliar combination of compassion and indignation. I consider myself lucky to be in a same-sex relationship at a time when that's all we have to deal with. My good fortune is thanks to the toil of those who held hands in more impossible times. My new chapter's an eye-opener, not just for me, but for everyone who sees me as a subject for their tolerance. Tolerance is overrated, and heterosexuality lost its moral majority a long time ago. The world has more important things to concern itself with than sexual orientation. On August the 7th, 2013, I walked her down to City Hall and married her. 46 years after the first time I felt shame, I feel, and not for the last time, pride. The christening story may be more memory than incident. I might be a little over-scrupulous in describing it, but it seems to me that my peculiar disregard for holding on to shame is in part because I know what's worthy of shame and where to place it, not in self-recrimination, but in experience. I feel the same about its opposite. Pride is something I find just as uncomfortable if I hang on to it. Both pride and shame are feelings. They're necessary parts of being human, no more or less important than each other, and may be only useful because of their contrast. It seems to me that if we can coax the salutary and unsalutary parts of ourselves to hold hands, we'd strengthen our spines instead of our prejudices. The privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. It's your superpower to be different from, not better than. Complex, layered, analogous to nothing and no one, as my girl would say. 